Hello, everyone. This is Speedy Master Victor Nostroyev. And uh, today we are going to talk about five forces determining your chess strategy in the game. But before we continue with uh, our main topic for today, let's check the homework from the recent webinar that we did last Sunday. Okay, so we are waiting for more people to join. Uh, what else I can share? Uh, on Tuesday, <clears throat> last Tuesday, I played the, in on chess.com in the tournament, which is called Title Tuesday. So it was very hard to stream and play at the same time. I had some problems with uh, with my computer. Uh, so that's why every time when I was um, playing the game and streaming it, um, so either the internet was lagging or my web browser was frozen. So I started with four zeros. And then uh, in the next seven rounds, I scored five of seven. So I finally ended with five of 11 in uh, that title Tuesday. Well, it's not a good result, but it's a good result for the first time participating in such tournaments, especially experience technical issues. So I'm trying to adjust my uh, streaming settings. And uh, next Tuesday, I'm still going to participate in uh, such an event. Oh, maybe, maybe better. Uh, yeah, so don't uh, miss it. Maybe, I well, I'm going, to, at least I'm going to try to stream it again, but this time only on Twitch. Oh, fine, please let me know whether the sound and video quality is good and we can start. Let me open the chat. Okay, here, okay. Uh, so participating in that computer thing, you think uh, there are a lot of cheaters in Title Tuesdays or what? Okay, anyway, so yeah, looks like um, everything is fine. Uh, let's uh, uh, work. So that was your homework. Let me actually, let me share it. This was your homework. So these two positions, uh, in the first one, the black, uh, black sacrificed the pawn on the G pawn. Uh, however, they got the central control and the question is uh, because of what they have a compensation. And that was the second example. So we are going to talk about these two um, variations uh, of the openings. And the task is to um, explain how to continue and uh, where black has a compensation here or white has advantage in the previous position. Before g5, so this move allows black to fight for the center because it distracts the knight. If the knight captures right away, it's e5, knight f3, and e4. Well, uh, this is a part of my opening repertoire. Uh, you can find it. Uh, well, there is a course on the chess world, how to play against knight f3. And this is where I explain all my strategies that I use to play against this move. And uh, this line is from that course. So um, bishop b2 is a better move. Bishop g7, knight g5, and then e5. Then the knight is under attack and has to go to the center. Well, how to play in this position? Do you, by the way, guys, have any ideas? So the question is how to play in this position for black. Okay, well, there is a very nice suggestion of doing uh, f5 and then h5. Well, I actually think that 
Uh, well, a5 here maybe, but I don't think it's so promising. So f5, definitely taking advantage of the center. So, well, and if the knight goes to g3, well, h5 uh, seems to be a bit optimistic. They can play e3, and if needed, they can, well, with, okay, h5, e3, they attack this pawn. So you can continue with h4, but knight h5. This is a bit problematic. So that's why h5 doesn't look so promising. But uh, just a simple move, knight f6 looks good. And you have the center control. So e4, for example, f4. If knight goes there, well, this time we have to play knight bishop f8. But uh, they don't get any advantage. And b4 is hanging, actually. For example, take, take. Let's say queen h5, check. Mm, even king d8 looks good. So queen, queen b3 is a possible move, uh, but in which position? Okay, so um, f5 definitely yes, and in uh, then they can play knight c5. However, you can play b6 and uh, quickly develop your bishop. So, for example, queen e4, king f7 to avoid complications. Because if you play c6, um, then there is a pin that they can potentially take advantage of king f7, and you don't need to castle. So here, the white's advantage is mainly because of the center control. Uh, doing a5 move is possible too, but isn't so promising. So b5 probably, but you still have to play f5. They go g3 maybe this time. E4, e4. Well, well, you just include these moves. And now, after knight h5, you play this move. The pawn is not hanging, so it's not so promising. Well, a4, a3, e3, e3, right. But once you play e4, they will play e3. So that's why mm, I think that just f5 and uh, knight f6. Or if he goes there, b6, bishop, b7. And domination in the center provides you with advantage. Okay, so let's now talk about the second example here. How white should play? What's your opinion? Any suggestions? C4. Well, C4, you just transpose to mark the bind. D takes C5 favors black. So, okay, so C4, C takes D4, and, And this is Marux de Bind, so which is, uh, well, it's quite playable for black. Mm, a famous opening, so knight f6, for example, bishop c5, what else? Uh, a6 even. Uh, d takes c5 only favors uh, black because they move their bishop to a better position. But d5, like uh, John uh, suggested, appears to be a very simple move which provides a white uh, with advantage. So, for example, pawn takes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then if knight b8, knight c3. Well, knight b8 seems uh, very bad because after that, even instead of knight c3, you can play d6 and threaten with queen e7. So here, for example, queen e5 uh, with king d8 idea is a must, or maybe queen f6. Now, once you do this, they block with the queen or try to go there. But then knight c3, and if they decide to take, you have knight b5. And this is a very problematic. Well, um, if they take with the queen, it doesn't make much difference. You exchange and still play that. So the, if the bishop moves, there is a fork. So they move there. But it's still a problem because after f6 here, you can castle and still take there. So take take this this is hanging 
or white is completely winning. So that's why taking on d5 for black is a mistake. So they'd better play knight a5 or knight c7. Well, maybe here you mean that they can play queen e7 move. But, uh, and then knight e5. But uh, how does it work? So look at the position. Uh, white is about to play rook e1, after which this queen will be in the trouble. So probably knight f6, rook e1, d6, and then uh, bishop b5 check. So bishop d7. Uh, there is a pin here, so because knight uh, knight takes g takes f three. The the queen is pinned. Uh, well, so for example, you take pawn takes, and uh, something like bishop f four may work. So we are even mm, let the bishop hanging on b5 because we have a great threat with rook takes e5 okay fine so looks like uh, after d5 uh, white uh, grabs space and uh, doing something like knight c7 is a must but then it's uh, it still can be d6 or even just knight c3 because uh, white has extra space and better development Obviously, the white's position is better. Please do not forget about it. Do not forget about this move because um, very often the black uh, Sicilian players do not take on d4. Uh, and if you uh, have a chance to play d5, gain the tempo on the knight and at the same time um, grab more space, you are likely to obtain advantage. Okay, fine. So... Uh, so we are done with the homework. What are we going to talk about today? Well, today we are going to talk about five forces determining your chess strategy. Well, I mean, once uh, a chess strategy of one of the players in the game. Uh, what are they? So let me first uh, explain. There are five uh, forces. We can uh, divide them into... Well, we can... Okay, so let me explain. So which forces are external factors? And uh, by saying external factors, I say, for example, I mean, for example, the time control. So, of course, if you play Blitz uh, and if you play a longer game, the strategies are different. Because in Blitz, you prefer to uh, play on time sometimes. So, well, you want to sharpen the position for your opponent. However, if it was a long game, maybe you would prefer playing a more solid move. Um, second, it's a type of a competition, whether it's a team competition or just an individual uh, championship, like, uh, for example, just an open. Uh, well, in team competition, uh, you shouldn't lose because, uh, uh, well, if you lose, your team is likely to lose and... Uh, that affects not only your performance, but uh, the way your team perform. So that's why uh, you, in team competitions, you usually choose a more solid continuations rather than uh, playing aggressively. Uh, it can be a tournament situation. Uh, for example, I'm not going to show this example today, but uh, I enter it as a homework. So I edit this game as a homework, but uh, for example, uh, for example, the games between Kasparov and Karpov. So very often Kasparov had to win the last match. Uh, and uh, about tournament situation, I had a similar problem where in, um, there, there were nine rounds, and in, in the eighth round, in order to become a FIDE master and to score, uh, to get 23 and 5 rating, I had to win, uh, I had to score one point and a half in the last two rounds. So in the round eight, there were nine rounds totally, in the round eight, I had to win with white pieces. And that affected the way I was playing. I was trying to create complications to force my opponent to make a mistake. And finally it worked. So it was really tough. 
the position was equal after the opening stage of the game. Then I made some mistakes. He made some mistakes. I tried to sharpen the position. I tried to provoke him to defend his position. So finally, he made a mistake and they scored at that point. And in the last round uh, with black pieces, it was just enough for me to draw the game. So I was playing without any risk. I mean, I was trying to play, not uh, taking a risk. And because of that, it affected the strategy that I was um, uh, I was initiating there. Okay, and then uh, the the effect or the influence of the time control and time pressure. Of course, it affects. When you have a time pressure, you are trying to make more solid moves, um, uh, which are not so responsible. I mean, you don't take extra responsibility when you are low on time. You don't choose the continuations which require you to calculate a lot of lines. However, if your opponent is in the time trouble, then you, uh, of course, initiate such um, combinations or maybe series of exchanges where a precise calculation is required. What else? Uh, well, the second, that was the first force, external factors. The second is material. So first of all, uh, when you have extra material, or when you're playing down some material, it affects the way you're playing. For example, if you have extra material, you don't need to do an attack. You don't need to uh, attack enemy weaknesses. What you need is just to exchange pieces and realize extra material in the end game. Um, also uh, about exchanges. So uh, any exchanges affect the strategy that you are going to uh, come up with after you uh, exchange some pieces, especially after queens are exchanged, because the queen exchange is very significant for the game. Like you had an attack or your opponent had an attack, you exchanged the queens, now his attack no longer works, and instead you should play for weaknesses, and your opponent should somehow defend it. So it significantly changes um, the situation on the board. Uh, that was the second force, material. Everything related to the material can be here. And the third is a human factor. So some special features of the way you're playing, your playing style, as well as playing style of your opponent. Like, for example, I'm more a tactical player and I would prefer to have sharp positions where a lot of calculations have to be initiated and it's easy to make a mistaken calculation for both. And I think that I can be better in calculation rather than many of my opponents. And of course, I prefer to attack, but even if I have to defend, it's fine. However, uh, the key idea is that the position should be uh, sharp well, this is the way I like to play, when the position is sharp and a lot of factors have to be taken into account. And now the fourth uh, force, positional it's positional factors. What positional factors? Space, pawn structure, the control over key uh, squares and uh, certain lines as well as the control over the center. So if you control the center, you gonna use the center and for example, you maneuver with your pieces through that center, uh, or you instead uh, push your pawns and chase enemy pieces away from the center. Uh, well, if you control certain squares, uh, you can maneuver through them and bring your pieces from one side to the other side. And of course, uh, the pawn structure um, defines the position and determines your future plans. I even created a course which is uh, devoted to the pawn structures. And based on the pawn structure, I illustrated most common uh, working plans. Uh, this is a planning guide for club players. It's also on the chess world. If you need... Okay, so if you need any links, just let me know. Um, and the fifth factor is initiative. So as for write down these forces, uh, guys, if you registered for this webinar, 
uh, you are likely to get an email uh, tomorrow where I explain it again. Uh, so with a summary as well as with the recording. So the fifth uh, force is initiative. Uh, the so-called material ratio into the attack. Well, if you have more pieces on one side of the board, you are likely to play there. If you have space on that side of the board, you are still likely to play on that side. So if, for example, you have uh, several pieces into the attack, but your opponent defends with just a few, you are likely to succeed with the attack on the enemy king. Uh, if you can quickly initiate such an attack, for example, if your pieces are already targeting the enemy king's position and you can bring them uh, quicker, it also affects your strategy, as well as pieces coordination, the way of how the pieces uh, may interact with each other. And of course, the position of the king. If the enemy king is in trouble, then you create an attack. If your king is in trouble, then you should look for how to make it safer or how to swap the queens off to, um, to eliminate any danger to your king. Uh, well, uh, so uh, please register for the webinar and you are likely to get this email automatically. Uh, I, well, probably you will already register. Okay, fine. So uh, let's start our uh, class uh, with the analysis of the games between, uh, well, first game between Anatoly Karpov and Peter Swidler. So did everything I explained is clear to you or you want to um, so get more explanation or what? So just let me know if anything is not clear. Fine, um, let's continue. So that was the game between Karpov and Swidler. Grunfeld, but a very specific Grunfeld where Queen B3 was played. I don't like this variation for white, but uh, that time it was quite popular. Uh, D takes E4, the Queen has to move once again, and this is the main feature why I don't like uh, the Queen moved twice. Castle, E4, A6 with the idea of B5. E5, B5 anyway, taking the Queen, the Queen moves, and the Knight has to go to D7. And now what can we say? Can we evaluate this position? For example, uh, what, well, let's talk about the factors that affect the evaluation of the position. So white has the center, there are knights are well placed, the queen on b3 is already doing something, but uh, black is better developed. Uh, they have uh, castled, uh, there is a bishop on uh, g7. Uh, knight on d7 already. So, well, generally speaking, it's equal. And here, uh, better center control uh, versus better development for black. And uh, the white's task is to either take advantage of their center control somehow or uh, quickly develop their pieces further. So what would you suggest? Okay, there is queen d5 move. Queen d5, uh, but queen d5 means knight b6, and then if you exchange, uh, if you exchange the queens, uh, black is completely fine. What else? I can give you a hint. Uh, in this position, uh, I mean, in in this game, I would like to illustrate how the pawn structure affects the, the strategy that one player should um, initiate based on the pawn structure. So, okay, thanks. E6 is screwing to be played. This is what John says, absolutely right. Well, how they should play? Well, if they let us take, then we can take advantage of a pin. So they have to take. Then queen takes E6, of course, makes sense, but uh, let's say here king goes to h8 and then what? If you try knight g5 it's unlikely to work at least because they have knight here or a knight anywhere so even knight f6 looks fine because after this it seems that a better development 
uh, is more important. So d4 is hanging. But I actually think that uh, after knight g5, knight e5 is enough. So queen d5, let's say, queen d5, take, then this move. And uh, this move is not a good idea because d4 is hanging and this knight can be dangerous too. So uh, black is completely fine here. Uh, but the key idea of this move is to not... Uh, uh, to not uh, take this pawn right away, but to make this a weakness, to ruin the pawn structure, win this pawn later, and instead take advantage of a better pawn structure. So bishop a3, knight f6. Now the pawn is protected, it's not easy to win it right away. So maybe castle queen side and uh, some king side attack, but this is too risky. Uh, however, here, uh, Karpov improves his pieces. What he needs is to play with the bishop to c4, ideally. Then that's why he undermines the b5 pawn with this move. So you cannot defend it. A takes, c takes, knight b5 just, and the a pawn is pinned. b takes a4, rook takes a4. a6 is potentially the object of the attack. It's protected now, but it can be a weakness. Also, the rook defends d4 if needed. Knight goes there, and the bishop is going to go to c4, so targeting this. Well, queen d6 protecting would face with knight g5, and the pawn uh, can be lost anyway. Well, okay, queen d6, knight g5, knight d8, let's say. Then, uh, for example, how do we play? Well, d5 doesn't work. Okay, let's just play h3. h3 stops knight g4 and any counterplay. If bishop b7, we take on e6. If, uh, let's say, a5, we can just castle. And again, bishop a6 here uh, means that uh, black is left with uh, weak pawns only. Oh, for example, take, take. Just queen a2, adding more pressure on e5. So there is no need to win the pawn on e6 right away. So uh, queen d6 would lead to a passive defense. Rook b8 was played in the game. Well, now white decides to win this pawn. And, uh, well, they didn't take because then queen takes. Uh, there is a knight hanging, so they play king h8, queen c4. Now bishop a6, queen takes a6, and queen d6 offer in an exchange. But look at these pawns. All they are isolated. The number of pawns is equal. The b2 is also a weakness. d4 potentially a weakness, but we can definitely say that white has a better pawn structure. Uh, and based on it, uh, white decides which, uh, which plan to initiate here. So what do you think? Which plan would you suggest for white in this position? Should we exchange the queens right away by taking on g6? Should we retreat to a2 to support the pawn on b2 as well as to pressure a6? So, knight g5, thanks Brian, h4 um, cannot be played, the queen is hanging, but knight g5, yes, because this exchange doesn't favor black, everything is hanging, including a6. Maybe knight b4, trying to target to d3, so rook a7, attacking this. So, knight c2, king d2, and after rook b2, it seems that white has... Advantage, uh, for example, white can continue with this move. This is always a weakness. And once the pawn moves, there is a weakness here. Well, the pawn moves to c6, of course. So uh, that's why uh, maybe knight d8 seems like a good move here, chasing the queen away. But then the knight is very passive. And this time, moving the queen to a2 looks fine. So knight g5. Well, uh, black decided that they can take on b2 which was a mistake. So why rook b2 is a mistake? Who can tell me?
So actually, yes, knight of seven. Knight of seven can be played, and uh, this is not so risky. So rook f7, queen f7, and how they should play. So e5, let's say. But e5 is not a big issue. Now we can castle and let them take. For example, castle, we let them take. Then knight e4. Why knight e4? The purpose of this move is to... Uh, to control the e8 square, so queen e8. Now, if uh, bishop f8, there is a very nice move. It's rook d4, look at this move. So it's a double attack. And uh, if knight takes, it's bishop takes, and this is a double attack too. If queen takes, it's a checkmate here. So rook d4 works well. That's why instead of the bishop, the queen should block. And if so, just queen e4, attacking on c6. They probably take there. We don't want to lose this pawn. So f takes e4 with a temper. And the queen is overloaded. It has to protect this. And at the same time, it has to protect the back rank, e8 square. So for example, if the queen goes there, then after rook a6, we are completely winning. Queen takes, this leads to a checkmate. So they have to play queen e7. But if so, we take, they take, we go there, maybe rook f2, maybe black gets a compensation here, uh, but uh, white is definitely playing for a win with extra exchange. It's just one pawn as a compensation. Well, if you don't want uh, to um, play like that, you can start with bishop c1 in this position. Rook moves, bishop a3, and then you are still targeting this square. Okay, fine. So knight f7 was the best move. Karpov didn't like it. He castled. Maybe because uh, of his uh, uh, of his personality. He is a player who prefers to play more solid moves rather than uh, sharpen the position and uh, win because of complications. So he's more a positional player rather than a tactician. But at the same time, when he was um, a world champion, and a few years after that, he was extremely good with tactics too. So knight d8. Queen goes to h3. Uh, well, the black's position is playable. It's quite solid. But at the same time, it's uh, hard to find moves because they have a lot of weaknesses. The computer would definitely hold the position. But a human player can hardly do it. So here, in order to simplify, Swidler decides to play queen d7. Well, that was a kind of inaccuracy. Instead, h5 is the best move to secure this, uh, because the queen from h3 is targeting, and this becomes a threat. So h5, knight g4, knight takes knight, and queen d5. So it's possible to hold this position. So the knight is under attack, the d4 is always under the pressure. Uh, instead, uh, Swidler decides that while he is in attack, he should swap the queens off. But the end game is tough for him too. So now white definitely has advantage. We cannot say that this advantage is huge, but it's enough to uh, at least play for a win and force black to defend the position um, to the very end of the game. Uh, well, why this position is better for white? Well, first of all, these pawns are isolated. Second, there are a lot of weak squares that this knight can occupy. And once uh, the position contains knight, it becomes uh, tactical. It becomes complicated and tactical. So that's why uh, black should uh, look for any tactical strikes that these knights can initiate h4, rook c2, knight goes there, so let's skip a few moves here, I don't want to pay uh, much attention to it, um, the rooks were exchanged, looks like the knight occupied a very good spot, protecting these two pawns,
Okay, so here we come to a critical moment. Uh, some exchanges happened, but the weaknesses still exist. And uh, here, uh, well, white black tries to simplify the position by exchanging more pieces, but this is already a mistake. So doing 96 uh, doesn't work well here. Actually, it does work, but I'm not sure if you get a winning position. So bishop a5, you can get rid of a pin. But uh, then, uh, let's say they take, and uh, I'm not 100% sure that this is winning. Even, even it's a draw, because we are, main, we are playing on one side of the board with a knight versus bishop. So the bishop doesn't have advantage. Okay, so the, that was the case where the bishop's superiority doesn't matter. Okay, knight d7, rook d7 was played, and rook c6. So uh, Karpov played really well this time. He forced black to stay uh, passively and just defending his pawns. The knight is restricted. The only square it can move is b6, so he goes there. Bishop c1, uh, rook d5, trying to attack. Rook e6, attacking and defending. And this is where um, this is where uh, Black should repeat the position and play Rook D7. After which, maybe some G4 and King activity can be initiated, like then F4. Uh, the the King may invade the enemy camp, uh, but you should be accurate and pay attention to the enemy threats. This move can be played to attack C5. So. This position looks uh, much better for White. Most likely white wins, but the game continued with knight c8. What do you think? How should uh, white play this time to take advantage of these weaknesses? So, what are your suggestions? Rook cannot take e7 because there is a knight on c8. Well, Swidler just played the knight c8 because he wanted it. Okay, so Bartholomew suggests h5. Uh, this is what uh, Karpov played. It's not the best move, but it's, uh, it's a possible move. Uh, what else? Bishop a a3, you mean? Yes, it's bishop a3. Bishop a3, and how does it work? Well, c5, rook c6. This is a target. Well, uh, you cannot take on e5. Your knight is hanging, so knight a7, rook c7. Knight b5, fine, but it doesn't help because rook e7 checks. And after the king moves, we can move the bishop and gain another temper, and the e5 pawn becomes dangerous. So maybe knight d4, bishop h6, uh, knight f5. However, it's still possible to solve this issue with these checks. Just that. And white should be winning in this position. Even after this. So king e8 maybe. Bishop f4, then uh, something like that, or maybe rook c7 immediately. Uh, depends on how black plays. So this is this is a winning position. G6 is a weakness, and you can advance the pawns here. Uh, fine. Karpov instead played h5. Uh, G takes h5 and rook h6. King g7, rook takes. Well, the white's position improved anyway. So h5 was also a possible way. c5. He plays king of three, maybe not the most accurate play, but it's fine. Uh, then bishop e3, so the knight cannot go, neither to a7 or b6. e6, rook h4 attacking, so there is no way for the rook to block. Knight goes to e7, and after that, it's obvious that this is a winning position. The pawn is poisoned. 
knight g6, bishop d4. And now taking means king e4 and f4. So white takes advantage of the pin. With two extra pawns, white is completely winning. So here, the key idea was to illustrate that uh, after doing uh, e6, this, the whole white strategy is based on the weaknesses of the enemy pawns. And even in the end game, after all pieces are exchanged and white, black was playing uh, quite well, trying to defend, these weaknesses still exist. And uh, during the whole game, you can pressure them and because of that, uh, create threats and provoke your opponent to make mistakes. So, uh, a bad pawn structure itself uh, doesn't guarantee a win, but uh, because of bad pawn structure of your opponent, you are trying to add pressure, you attack weak pawns, and in order to save material, your opponent has to put his pieces to passive to a passive defense and um, allow you to obtain more opportunities. Okay, so the next game, I'm sure you will enjoy it. It's the game by Mikhail Chigorin. Uh, this game is devoted to such a force like initiative. So you remember uh, initiative means uh, what? Initiative means like, uh, for example, uh, material majority once you initiate the attack let's say you have more pieces on one on the king side rather than your opponent and because of that uh, your attack is likely to be successful what else uh, the speed of your pieces i mean the ability of your pieces to move to the side to the place of action as quick as possible uh, much quicker than your opponent's pieces uh, the coordination of your pieces and the position of the king. So here we cover almost all these uh, factors which form uh, this force, the initiative. Um, well, you'll see. So the game was quite old, so I don't want you to pay much attention to the um, to the opening stage of the game it was italian i play bishop g5 myself too but with the pawn already on c3 uh h6 bishop h4 g5 very common response bishop g3 and uh h5 in this position so not a good move actually this move should be parried what do you think how white should play in this position So Brian thinks it's a free pawn and knight g5 can be played. Well, knight g5, and then this, knight f7, to create a fork, maybe, maybe. Bishop takes e5, no, this is definitely a mistake. What's the purpose? Let's say knight takes. You lose a pawn for, for what? Oh, well, maybe not knight, but bishop pawn takes, but doesn't matter. So uh, h4 should be played, that's right, h4. This is the best move here. And after, well, g4, it's completely fine. Then the knight goes to g5. There is no need to win this pawn because um, uh, white creates more problems to himself. Um, so, well, h3 is a mistake because it allows us to play g4 and open the h file right away, as well as h4 first and then g4. No, this is a terrible position. How do you? How does this knight survive? Because it's knight d4 and h3 coming. And what? After h3, do you have to play g3 and uh, get the bishop locked? Of course not. So h3 is not a good move. h4 and uh, the white's position is better. So this, this. There is a pin that black cannot get rid of.
So, uh, yeah, h4 is a must. In the game, white played this move, which is a mistake. h4, knight f7. And what do you think? How to play? H takes g3, so Brian wants to sacrifice the queen. Okay, interesting. Anybody else uh, want to suggest? Well, what else can be played? So I'm. Uh, I usually prefer to not sacrifice the queen if it's not uh, required. So. No, I don't understand. What does it mean? Bishop takes. It's not the bishop. It's knight takes. You mean this? Well, it's white. E one. Okay, no, I can hardly understand it. Well, it's e d8. This square is d8. But it's uh, the question is how black moves. Uh, well, black can try this move. Okay, so for those who joined recently, we are talking about five forces that uh, determines the strategy in the chess game. So this is the one of the forces which is called initiative. So here by sacrificing material, uh, black develops initiative on the king's side and uh, succeeds with their attack due to, uh, due to several factors, which we are going to talk about. So queen e7 is a better move. Now if they take h takes g3 becomes a problem because uh, if they take back it's queen h here and knight g4. So let's say this, king e7, knight g6, king takes, knight goes there. Uh, we have two minor pieces for a rook and three pawns, but uh, at the same time we have an attack. Knight d4 and so on. The attack continues. We can even try this and uh, sacrifice the queen on h4 once uh, we are sure that the king cannot hide from our attacks. So queen e7 was the best move, but in the game Chigorin played h takes g3. So uh, black sacrifices the whole queen. Well, here it's marked with inaccuracy. Why? Because queen e7 was a more solid way to continue. But h takes g3 still uh, provides black with advantage. So knight d8, how to continue? So here if you say g takes h2, king h1, and the king is safe. So no. But what would you suggest? Uh, well, in such positions, uh, you should imagine that you already checkmated. How does this checkmate look like? And then you are trying to uh, find the way of how to reach that position where the king is checkmated the way that you imagined. Okay, so any suggestions? So knight, uh, I don't understand this move. Knight c3 takes c1, so well, this is c3 square, this is c1, so what do you mean? Maybe knight takes here? Well, I mean, knight takes here. Maybe this is, ah, this is what you mean. Knight from c6 takes on d8. So if you look at my screen, actually, these squares are, um, I mean, there is notation. So this is d8 square. 
Okay, so knight takes d8. Well, yeah, possible, but can you instead develop initiative? Because once you make this move, you move your knight out from the place of action. If the knight wants to join the attack, it has to go to d4. Okay, there is a nice idea of rook h2 with uh, bishop uh, coming to h3. But the problem is that they play this and stop your bishop. So if you can quickly bring the rook, then you will be able to checkmate. But it seems to not work. So, for example, king e7, trying to bring uh, this, just bishop h3. And you have to sacrifice more material. Okay, maybe bishop first sacrifice. No, uh, let's avoid sacrifices here and sacrifice only in case if you see that it delivers a checkmate. So g takes f2. Well, g takes f2, king h1, and what then? So if you play knight g4 to threaten checkmate here, it's just h3. And uh, well, if you bring the knight to g3, you will checkmate, but how? So bishop g4. Well, this... Um, Example is about uh, all factors which uh, form uh, initiative. So first of all, the number of pieces on the king side. Black definitely has more pieces. Uh, what else? Uh, the um, the I mean, a speed. How quickly. Uh, the um, pieces may join the king side, like bishop g4 immediately with a tempo forcing the queen to move. Uh, also, the position of the king is compromised and the coordination of black pieces is perfect. So here they save their queen because if they lose it, then uh, black is uh, completely winning. So, and now we continue with knight d4. Well, knight e2, king h1, rook h2. This is how a checkmate look like. Okay, uh, let's decide if uh, you can find a way of how white can save the game here. What do you think? Bishop f7 check. How does bishop f7 help? Let's say I capture on d8 with my king. So I think John is correct. It's h3. Knight e2. And king h1 now still loses. This is a checkmate. But if now they sacrifice the queen, it looks fine. Knight goes to e6. So let's save the bishop. Knight c3, bishop f1, king f1. So uh, here, well, g takes f2 or just king d7. Because I don't think that they can capture. If, let's say, they capture, we play this move, and then we have an attack. Because how do they save it? This, then maybe knight g4 even works. So, uh, well, white has some compensation for the exchange, not in uh, in this position. So king d7, maybe they play f3, and this is where they have some compensation, two pawns. Black is better, but it's still playable for white. In the game, uh, white ignored it. I mean, nothing, maybe they just didn't find, but the move they played was knight c3. They were trying to bring pieces and protect it too. However, this move is already a mistake, and your task is to tell me why. It's a decisive mistake. So it looks logical, right? We protect the two. Maybe I would play such a similar move if it was a blitz game, but but uh, here it's completely well a crucial mistake, I would say. 
So this, 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 and this piece are initiating the attack. And uh, white is just trying to defend with his pawns and uh, uh, queen and knight. However, the knight only covers e2 square. So this is the only uh, function that uh, the knight does at the moment. Okay, can you please, uh, yeah, could you please guys uh, suggest the line, not only the first move. So here, Brian and John suggested knight f3 check, but uh, how does this move work? So what happens in case of g takes f3, let's say? Well, a g takes h2, the king goes to g2. Yes, everyone can uh, write answers. So knight f3, g takes f h2. If you take on h2, then the king goes there. Uh, okay, so this, this, rook h2, fine. But then I take your bishop. Okay, so there is a better way to play. So uh, in uh, two moves, uh, white resigned. Bishop h3. Okay, maybe, okay, so let's... Uh... <laughs> okay, so John suggests the same line. So first of all, if king h1, it's rook h2, right? Uh, and um, that's why they have to take here. Then... This, this is a checkmate. But if king g2, well, you are not sure how to win. And actually, it's not a winning position at all. Uh, well, okay, Let what the engine tells. White is plus six and five because of extra queen. So no, I don't know how to continue the attack. So this move, well, king g3, let's say. Take threaten to promote okay they take uh you can uh promote i think it's the best move take take 96 so taking here or here yeah i it's a queen and a minor piece for two rooks and the attack is stuck maybe king is seven here to play rook g8 but you cannot play rook g8 so what should i take On c7, or should I take on c5? I don't. Let's take here, and rook g8 doesn't work because of the bishop. Maybe rook h8 works. Yeah, rook h8 works actually. Now uh, f4 is a must, and only then the king escapes. But uh, okay, so looks like the initiative is not enough. That's why instead, after this move, you don't need to take on h2. You have to play this move right away and then rook h2 and then rook h1. Nothing can stop it. Right now you're threatening with this checkmate. How do they stop it? So this move, but this is a queen sacrifice. This move, but... Uh, it's just a check which doesn't change the position. H3, rook H3. So rook H1 is a threat. 
So here, by taking on a three with the bishop, um, well, because of this pin, it's impossible to stop the attack. So here you see, because of the ability of the black pieces to join the attack uh, as quick as possible, it was fine even to sacrifice the queen and get some compensation. Uh, that's why this factor, the, the ability of the pieces to go to the king side, while there are just a few pieces, uh, a few white pieces that can defend the king's position, uh, determined the strategy of uh, the black player, Mikhail Chiborin in our case, and um, he was able to initiate this very nice attack. Okay, fine. Uh, we have one more uh, game that we are going to go through, not uh, from the beginning to the very end, but um, um, let's work on it. So it's the game between Max Juve and Alexander Alekin. Slav defense, transformed to semi-slav, knight c3 and a6. Well, it's not a common move. Uh, so typically it's uh, knight d7 with bishop d6 ideas or knight d7 b6 bishop b7 which I don't like at all uh, but a6 was played well this move uh, the idea of this move is to play b5 but the disadvantage of this move is c5 so here Alekin undermines with uh, this b6 c takes b6 knight goes to d7 knight a4 knight takes there and bishop d2 with the idea of doing bishop a5 that's why it has to be captured right away uh what now well the pawn is hanging well i think the most natural move here can be doing this with the idea of doing c5 but uh, alexander alekin uh, decided to initiate some counterplay attacking the pawn on b2 so with queen b6 he protects on c6 and potentially pressures the b2 pawn rook c1 because taking here doesn't make sense it's queen c6 and queen e8 bishop d7 now knight e5 adding pressure so c5 is not a problem and queen takes b2 but this is already a mistake Knight takes d7, knight takes d7. What do you think? How to continue? c6 is hanging, but do you really have to capture it right away? So queen takes c6, should we play this move? Bishop a6 and castle. So I think bishop a6 is extremely risky. So how, for example, we react on this move? Rook takes. Maybe rook takes works. Yeah, it should be fine. So knight b8 is a mistake. But bishop a6 is very suspicious. Maybe bishop b4 can be played. Uh, because if queen b4, it's uh, queen takes queen, bishop takes, rook a6, and a2 is a weakness. Okay, so uh, definitely not bishop a6. Taking on c6 right away is a mistake because of what? Now black has a counterattack. Well, queen c6 is a mistake because uh, no, nobody knows. It's black to move. So I'm asking what black should do. So this is the last move. Rook b8. What's the purpose of rook b8? 
Bishop B8, I think I can even react with this move, Bishop A6. No, it's Bishop B4. What does this move do? So if Queen E8, King E7, and White is threatening with a checkmate as well as to capture the Queen. So after Bishop B4, maybe um, White doesn't take here, but how White continues? This is still a problem. This is a problem. And uh, this move is a problem. So probably take, uh, take, and something like that. Uh, but uh, then the position becomes equal. <coughs> Fine. That's why bishop d3, trying to pressure the queen. Uh, rook comes to b8. And now white plays a really perfect move. What do you think? Which move I'm talking about? So, um, yeah, I think John is correct here. Uh, well, what we should take into account in this position? Uh, well, the queen is in a difficult situation. Of course, I doubt that the queen can be trapped only in some conditions. Uh, so even doing right now, rook b1 doesn't trap the queen because they sacrifice it and then take the other rook on h1 and uh, well it doesn't make sense because uh, white has less uh, material to compensate the queen i mean black has enough more than enough material to compensate the queen exchange because two rooks and the bishop is uh, is a lot so right now uh, there is no way to get this queen trapped uh, maybe in future if uh, black makes some mi mistakes but after queen takes c6 looks like this queen doesn't have many squares so b6 b7 and the exchange of the queens uh, will happen that's why it does make sense to already already think about the strategy which is based on the assumption that the queens are exchanged so a move that provides you with uh, some advantage in the end game And such a move, uh, such a move here was king e2. So the two bishops and the concentration of white forces uh, near the place of action are likely to provide uh, white with advantage. So which move to play? Well, again, bishop b4 would work to try to exchange these, uh, uh, the, the one of the bishops. So bishop b4, let's say rook c2, queen e3, Queen takes a3, bishop a3, rook c6. Then a5. So it's not completely a losing position. But here in the game, it was rook b6, trying to defend weaknesses. Uh, well, taking on c6 was good, but rook b1 is fine too. Now, taking is a blunder. There is no better square uh, rather than a3. And queen takes, bishop takes. Rook takes b6, knight takes b6. And since this moment, I want you to play the game against me. So you will be playing with white pieces. I can, uh, okay, I can also send a picture to you. So we are going to play from this position. The last move was knight b6. You will be playing with white pieces. And uh, once we play the games on chess.com, uh, we will continue in uh, analyzing this game and uh, work on the end game. So how white prepared for this end game. So we're gonna check what you suggest and if, uh, well, your strategy was good, I will um, illustrate it too, but mainly we will uh, continue with uh, uh, Max UV strategy. Uh, so, uh, okay. Let's continue. So let me stop sharing the screen.
So before we start, if you want to support my webinars and donate, uh, this is uh, the link that you can use. Uh, you can donate through PayPal using this link. It's easy. You click this button, then uh, enter the amount you want to donate and then click PayPal. So it automatically redirects to your to the PayPal account you enter with your uh, username and then uh, uh, after that, in a few steps, the money are automatically delivered to my account. This helps me prepare the content better, uh, as well as as well as pay to people assisting me. For example, I'm working with another video master who who uh, chooses the games and then sends it to me for approval, and I choose among them and uh, I prepare the content for you. So now let's let's play. Play. Uh, tell me your username if you want to play. So classic brown, white's green. Anyway, I doesn't matter. Uh, then custom. So here I choose this fifteen plus ten. Uh, this and we are going to play from this position so I'm playing with black What what's going on? So what I'm doing wrong? Hmm, interesting. I don't understand it all. Okay, maybe let me do it in a different way. Let me refresh the page. Uh -huh, so it works. Wait a sec, why cannot I? Why can't I find you? Hmm. Okay, maybe I can uh, play a friend and do like that. Okay, maybe like that. So here it's possible, it's not possible to choose custom. It's very weird, it no longer works. Okay, who else wants to play? I completely don't understand what's going on uh, with uh, chess.com. Well, it's definitely something wrong with chess.com this time. So 15, okay. 
So custom, uh, custom position odds, uh, 15 plus 10, 10. Uh, oh, okay, so I can choose like that. Okay, so finally it worked. Terrible. Uh, it, yeah. So chess.com is not working well. Who else? Ah, I wasn't spelling. No, it should be fine. Okay, rook b1, very good move. So I cannot move the knight. Uh, I mean, I cannot move the knight to e4, how I originally wanted. So knight c8. Maybe knight d7 was a better move. I would cover this, but I can try it in the next game. Rook b8, fine. So let's castle because I don't want my king to be the object of the attack. Okay, then uh, Brian. Let's play. It doesn't allow me to type, so I can only choose. Okay, I can't even choose. Okay, so please wait, I will refresh it. Okay, rook e8 here, so... Well, then knight b6 probably. If rook takes, uh, yeah, if rook takes, it's actually a problem. No, not not this move. C five, rook a six, it's still a problem. Ninety six, ninety five. six my bishop has no space so 97 rook a6 okay let's do 97 uh okay so i'm going uh, to challenge uh brian this time Okay, so uh, if you guys have any questions, you can message me at tricksofchess at gmail.com. Rook b1, right, but this time I'm gonna play knight g7. Rook a6, okay, let me save uh, the bishop. Rook goes to b7, fine. Uh, at least I can try to save my pawns. No, a5 doesn't save anything, actually. 
maybe C5 works. Now let's play king e7. This move, bishop a6. Yeah, this is what I was expecting, but I can have some counterplay with rook a8 move. A4, okay, fine. Okay, my king needs an escape square, so let it be a five. Bishop d3 move, uh, so it's logical. The bishop goes back. I would like to capture this pawn. How can I do it? With this move, rook b2. Yeah, let's do this move. g3, fine. My goal is to go to b2. Okay, your challenge doesn't match the member's current match settings. So you need to adjust something. Uh, let me know once you do once you do it and I will uh challenge you back. So rook b2 this time isn't, well, it is promising. I can play rook a2, but yeah, rook, rook b2, rook a2. Okay, let me do it. e4, fine. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting move. And if I just take on a2, yeah, let me take on a2. Mm -hmm. Now what? Uh, so this move uh, allows uh, my opponent to pin me. So I want to choose this move instead. Rook a7. Rook a2, a5. Knight c8. No. So now the problem is that the king is too far from the place of action. So I can play rook a2, but what's the purpose? Okay, it seems that I have to play this move. Bishop h7. So let me try g6.
Uh, this is a problem. No, I cannot bring the king. D8. They cannot play this move because of rook c7. Okay, rook b8, let's say. King goes there. King D8, maybe. Uh huh. Looks like a serious problem, actually. And mainly because my king is out of the place of action, so unfortunately. This move, rook d6. So bishop f8. Oh, my plan was king c8, so I'm fine with this move. Okay, the link. Mm, let me see. If I can create custom position not uh, 15 plus 10, 10, paste, black and white link. Okay. Okay, the link is sent. Okay, check. So um, how to unpin in this position? By doing a check, oh, wait a sec, it doesn't work. I thought I can do it. Okay, rook b6 or rook e8. No, rook b6. But it's still a blunder. There is a quick win. Mm, not with this move. There was a better win. Ah, okay. Oh, it just blundered another pawn. Yeah, well... Yeah, this is a quick win too. Uh, where is the button to resign? Okay, here. Okay, well, yeah, you played well. Okay, Brian sacrifices material. Then I, I should be winning here. I am threatening f2, g2, h2. Now let me take this pawn. Maybe, okay, h5 is coming, so. Okay, let me do this. Mm -hmm. So the game started finally. Yeah, I'm gonna play a few moves here and then continue. So knight d7 seems to be a better way. Mm-hmm, rook b7, okay.
I don't want to play bishop d6 this time. So what else I can do? King e7. Let's do king e7. Okay, so here I'm winning. Yeah, because I just uh, chase uh, this uh, king away and then capture the pawn and uh, also king of eight is coming. Thanks for the game. And the last one left. So king is seven is a strong move. E4. Oh, interesting. No, I don't think E4 looks good. Mm -hmm. Rook B2. Let's try C5. So how to deal with rook a6, it's not uh, not obvious for me. Mm, this math, well, then I wanted to take on d4, I think. King a2, but for this move, I prepared bishop b4. I'm trying to take advantage of this pin. So the bishop is lost, uh, but I'm threatening actually to win two bishops, one and the other one. So probably this bishop should move, but then it's a losing position. So g6, king d6 doesn't work. I mean, king d6 does work, so d6 doesn't.
Why should I think white is already losing? So a rook sacrifice, I don't see the point. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so uh, we can go back to, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the game. We can go back to our previous um, position. So here, yeah, rook b1 was played and knight d7, similar to what you guys played. Rook, knight c8 was a terrible move. Well, after knight c8, it's rook b8, of course. And uh, then even if I castle, um, it's still a serious problem. So castle, bishop, a6 at least. A bit problematic. So, uh, well, knight d7 was played and bishop a6. Well, taking this pawn and leaving this as a pass pawn, that was the best strategy. Okay, so William comes. Hi, William. Uh, well, uh, let's continue the analysis. So this pawn becomes really strong once it is supported by a bishop pair. And the king is also close to the place of action. Of course, black needs to bring the rook. And their next move is this, so that's why uh, you cannot um, you cannot do anything. You have to chase this bishop away. The bishop moves, and after that, bishop b7, stopping rook e8. And now the pawn can move. So c5 doesn't matter. It's better to keep the pawn on d4 because it stops the enemy pieces activity. So a4. Well, they played bishop b8 move, but could they play anything else? Well, it's hard to suggest. So this move, let's say, uh, seems that uh, this is a protected past pawn, but uh, just rook b5, a5, a6, a7, how to stop all that stuff? Also bishop b4. Once you play this move, it's bishop b4. So bishop b8 was played first, rook b5 anyway, and bishop a7. Because if they played c4, it's a check, the king has to move uh, out of the place of action and you can still continue advancing your pawns. As well as bishop c5 is possible to cover this square and create the second pass pawn in case if the knight takes on c5. So bishop a7, d takes c5, then uh, knight takes on c5 and bishop b4. Well, taking with the bishop wasn't good at all. Then just a5. So knight takes pin and a5 anyway. King goes to c7, a6. Okay, so I play this exercise with those who tell me their usernames on chess.com. This is how it works. Uh, next uh, lesson, uh, when I'm going to illustrate another topic, we can play too. Uh, so a6 um, is not required because instead you can just... Oh, hi, William. Now I can see you. Okay, so a6 is possible, but in the game it was just this. Why? Well, bishop takes, and in this position it's fine uh, to grab material advantage after bishop takes d5. White will be two pawns up. So doing this, for example, fails because of rook b7. King goes there. And in this position, you can just capture only three. For example, even with a pawn. So they take, you take there. And, uh, well, white is likely to lose one more pawn. Um, so, for example, if they decide to play g5, it's a6 h6, it's a7, and they have to move the rook there, otherwise it's rook b8 and this. 
So this pawn will tie enemy pieces, especially the rook, because the king cannot come closer. The seventh rank is under the white's rook control. So rook e8 is a must. And here the strategy is simple. You just bring the king and capture these pawns and promote your h pawn. So king d6 was played instead. And despite that we have bishops of opposite color, it's a completely winning position. Why? Because we cover a8. So, but actually, UV experienced some issues here. He, he was repeating the position. Well, the key idea is to bring the rook there, but it's not possible because they play bishop d8. So that's why here he had to initiate some actions like this and weaken the position of uh, black pieces on the king side by doing this. So, and a... Uh, so what happened? Rook c3, rook b6 was played, and now he switches to the other side of the board and attacks there. So rook b3 uh, could probably give some chances for black in this position, but they didn't play such a move. So they played rook b2, king goes to d3, rook a2, they cannot take, it's protected. Rook a2 stops. And one of the ideas of white was to move this bishop away, attack this bishop and push a7. So that's why rook a2 was played. Rook g6 uh, and the king goes further. So bishop a3, just bishop d5, winning another pawn. Check uh, king b8 and uh, this time just king b5 because of inability of rook b3 move. Uh, then uh, king King b6, not sure, but king b5 would win. So king b5, rook a1, let's say, rook f6, check, king c6. Another check, king d7. No more checks, and then we win another pawn, and then we also take the h5 pawn, and with three pawns, uh, it's absolutely winning. Well, in the game, white made a mistake, rook g6, and could allow black to fight for a draw with this move, because this move restricts the king activity. But uh, black also made a mistake, and after that, it's completely losing. So, for example, rook g8, but bishop b7 is fine too. So, here, taking is a blunder. That's why it's better to take the pawn. But with two pawns, it's definitely winning. With no chances. Uh, if these pawns were very close to each other and it was possible to blockade using uh, the opposite squares, I mean using the dark squares, uh, that could be a draw. But these are two distant past pawns. That's why it's completely losing. Uh, however, it seems that Alexander Elikin tried to defend this position and that was the final move. So he mm, sacrifices the bishop on a6. And uh, after this move, uh, the game ended. So why did the game end? Well, uh, the key idea is that with this move, bishop to a6, he actually allows himself to play rook d8 and protect the a8 square. So this is the next move. They can sacrifice the bishop, but this is a completely winning position. Or they can accept this sacrifice, but after rook d8, king is 7 the queen is promoted. And for that queen, black has to sacrifice the rook, after which it's completely winning. So this is how the game ended. But uh, this game illustrates that uh, uh, the ability of the queens to get exchange soon, for example, like it appeared in this position, affects your strategy. Uh, instead of trying to move this bishop and castle king side, which typically, uh, which is normal and very common for middle games, here oh, White decided to put the king to e2 to bring it closer to the place of action, hoping that the queens are about to be exchanged very soon. And uh, they realized it uh, by the position of the of this uh, queen on b2, because this queen is either trapped or exchanged. For example, if the queen goes there, then queen c6 is likely to provoke a queen exchange, because moving the queen back means uh, to make get a very passive position and lose another pawn. So that's why the queens were exchanged um, in a few moves after this. And the end game is just better. 
Okay, so we have two more examples, um, but I provided, uh, I, I edit them as a homework. So let me send the homework to you. So this PDF file is your homework. So uh, take a look at the screen. Uh, these two positions, which we are going to talk um, next time. Uh, first of all, here, what happens if a queen takes a2? Uh, would you capture this pawn? Do you think it uh, does make sense? If yes, then please explain why. And the second position uh, is taken from the game between Kasparov and Karpov. Uh, please uh, tell me how white should play here to play for a win. Kasparov sacrificed the pawn, so black has extra pawn on b6. Uh, but he still could find a way of how to win. So I want you to find it. Well, yes, the class is over. We are done. So tomorrow you are likely to get an email with a summary as well as with the homework. So message me at tricksofchess at gmail.com uh, with your answers, uh, with any questions if you have. And uh, next webinar, that's going to be next Sunday, we will focus on something else. But before doing it, we will finish the homework and we'll cover these two um, these two positions and uh, I also explain how a plain style affects the strategy that you choose in your chess game as well as how a tournament situation for example Kasparov had to win that game how it affects uh, the way he was playing that game okay fine that's all for today any questions Anyway, so tomorrow you uh, will get an email with uh, with a recording. So if you missed anything, you can go through it and watch it once again. And uh, if not, then hope to see everyone next Sunday, same time. I will announce the topic of the next webinar uh, during the week, probably on Wednesday. So personally, I don't know Kasparov. I didn't meet him. Okay, that's the end. See you guys and thank you for coming. Bye-bye.